Well, good morning, church. I said, good morning, church. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Happy Pulpit Freedom Sunday to you. Say that 10 times fast. Um, it's good to have everyone here. I am thankful for the rain and the cold weather. I don't care if you are or not. I am. Um, why don't you Push find... <laughs> no. I've got a microphone and you don't. <laughs> find a praise book in front of you and find song number 25. I think it's a very fitting song for the beginning of the service. It's called, We Have Come Into This House. And you're welcome to stand or sit or roll in the aisles. It's entirely up to you. We have come into this house, gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house, gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house, gathered in his name to worship Christ our Lord, worship Him, Christ the Lord. So forget about yourself. So forget about yourself, concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Christ the Lord. Worship Him, Christ the Lord. Let us lift up holy hands. Lift up holy hands, magnify his name and worship him. Let us lift up holy hands, magnify his name and worship him. Let us lift up holy hands, magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord, worship Him, Christ the Lord. First verse, one more time. We have come into His house, gathered in His name to worship Him. We have come into His house. Gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house. Gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Given because you were forsaken, I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven because you were. Forsaken, I'm accepted. You are condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love. Amazing love. How can it be? 
Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. There you go. Amen. So glad y'all here this beautiful morning. God bless you for being here. And uh, glad to have some visitors with here this morning. And some of those who've been out of town traveling, glad you're back this morning. And pray for those who are traveling this morning as well. And at this time, what we'd like to do is go ahead and have our morning tithes and offerings by deacons that come forward. This time, we've got a unique little different service today. I'm thankful. Looking forward to what God has for us today. want to welcome everybody to a most unique service this morning. This is called Pulpit Freedom Sunday. What you are going to hear this morning is probably going to offend just about everybody in here. Amen. But you know what? I would rather offend you, tell you the truth, and save your hide than do you come to me later and tell me, why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you say something? Blood will never be on my hands if I have anything to do with it. In the 1770s, in an Episcopalian church in Virginia, Pastor Peter Muhlenberg came to the pulpit as he normally did with, a, with his robe on, and he began reading out of the book of Ecclesiastes. And he read about where there's a time for this and a time for that. And then he read where there was a, a time to fight. And then he pulled his robe off to reveal the uniform of a colonel in the colonial army. And from there he began to recruit people to fight for freedom in America. At the same time, his brother, a little north of here, who was also a pastor, wrote and said, How dare you bring politics and world events into the house of God? There is no place for that. And very shortly after that, British soldiers walked in that man's church and bodily set him out in the street and took his church over as a command post and his politics changed as well. And he joined his brother. On a more timely note, I was standing at the D-Day Memorial 
a little over a year ago. And if you've never been there in Bedford, you really ought to go and it would give you some appreciation of what people went through to buy our freedom. And you need to understand this in World War II, that's what they were over there for. They were over there because we were attacked and, and we were in jeopardy of having a swastika flying over our capital had they not stood up and fought. And they had a, a very dramatic effect of, uh, of bullets popping out of the ground like a machine gun was hitting it and there were fallen soldiers everywhere. An 85 year old man walked up to me and he had a baseball cap that said he was a World War II veteran so I didn't need to ask him anything about himself. And he came right up to me and he stood beside me for a minute and he looked and then he looked me in the eye and he said, that was almost me. He said, I was fighting during that time. And he said, I think we did it for nothing. I didn't know what to say until I told him. He said, we're losing all our freedoms in this country. And I told him, I said, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to do everything I can not to let that happen. Amen. This morning, I want you to ignore what you have seen on the news lately because they are liars from the pits of hell. They are. What we're going to tell you this morning is the truth. If you are offended at the truth, I would simply tell you to pray and ask God to open your eyes and don't get mad at me and the people that are here to tell you the truth. We love you. We want to see you succeed and we want to see this country have a revival, but there are things that are going to have to happen, some very drastic things. And so before we have the music and the message, I have three gentlemen that are gonna come and share their perspective and some information that they have on some things that are going on in the country. And the first one that I'm gonna to ask to come and speak is Mike Duff. Good morning, church. God just spoke to me just now and said, we got to do something before I say anything. And I'm going to count to three. I want everybody in here to holler hallelujah as loud as you can holler it. One, two, three. Hallelujah! hallelujah. Amen. God is on the throne. Yes. Amen. Jesus is on the throne this morning, people. He said, fear not. Amen. Fear not. we got a lot of things to be afraid about. If you don't have Jesus Christ on your team this morning, then you probably are in fear. There's probably a lot of fear going on. The administration that, I don't call it administration, I call it the regime. Because that's exactly what it is. This man told us from the beginning that everything he does was going to be in the light. And that we'd all see it. Everyone would see it. There's been nothing this administration or regime or whatever you want to call that up uh, has done that's been in the light. Everything they have done has been in the dark. All in the dark. We know nothing. If you're listening to ABC News or CBS News or NBC, for God's sake, not NBC. But if you're listening to those, any of those stations, then you're being lied to. They're in bed with this president. They're all in there with him. All of them. And I'm telling you this morning, our country is on the path to fire and brimstone. Sodom and Gomorrah, you can't even find an existence of them anywhere. Now what's Jesus going to do? Look at Sodom and Gomorrah and go, I'm sorry, I had to let them go. They're the United States. I don't think so. I don't think that Jesus operates that way. He's true and just. And justice is coming quick. Real quick. We can see it right now, people. It's in the playbook. This is our playbook right here. It's right there. He's told us what was going to happen and what to expect. Here it is. Just like he said. 
right is wrong, wrong is right. We are com this, this administration is completely out of control this morning. Completely. If this man comes back for four more years, I'm going to tell you right now, America as we know it is over. Young people, all these young people in church today, it's going to affect everybody. It's going to affect everybody in the United States for sure. Me included, everybody. But you're going to pay the brunt. You're going to pay it. You're going to pay it. Your children are going to pay it. Your grandchildren and their grandchildren. You will never get over this debt. You, we cannot pay it off. The United States owes $126 trillion this morning in debt. If we take all of our debt, Social Security, Medicare, all of that, with the 16 plus trillion dollars that we got in immediate debt right now. There's no way, people. That's unsustainable. It's not going to happen. Somebody's going to get their feelings hurt. And it's coming soon. Real, real soon. The world is on fire. We are that close to being on fire. That close. All it's going to take is one ignite from somewhere in this country and we're going to be just like Greece. Because there's no difference between us and Greece. Our, what we owe is astronomical compared to what they owe. They're minimal compared to what we're in debt. And our children and their children and grandchildren are going to pay this debt. They're going to pay this debt. Somebody's going to pay it. I guarantee you they're coming. They're coming for the money because they're going to get that money. I guarantee it. There's some perilous times coming, people, is what I'm trying to say. Perilous. Just like it says in the book. And it's starting to happen right now. The church has got to get its head out to sand or wherever we have it buried and stand up and say something to the United States. These people need to hear this. Half of the country is lost. Lost. I mean, you could, I, I believe Obama could stand up here this morning and tell you he's going to cut every one of their heads off and they would stand up and applaud. It's demonic, people. It's demonic. It's demonic. Until we realize it's demonic and the church stands up, nothing's going to happen. We've got too many mealy mouth pastors standing up and, and talking about how good everything is. And it's just so wonderful. Can't y'all do? Oh, y'all are just doing so great. I'm so proud of you. I mean, that's sick. Because none of us on this earth deserve that. We're all sinners. Every single one of us. A lot of us in here worse than others. Me included. I was, I don't know if you've heard the old Hank Jr. song, I've seen my name at the top of the page. I've been there. I've seen it right on up next to the top. Just as devilish and bad as, I was a bad, I was a good son. I was a good son. Real good son. I knew how to sin. Oh yes. No problem at all. Now I can honestly say I never killed anybody or never went to that extreme, but I was bad. And all of us in here have been bad once or twice or sometime in our life. There are things in our life that we don't want everybody in here to know. Well, guess what? Everybody's going to know it because they're going to shout it from the rooftops. Everybody's sin is going to be concealed. Everyone's going to be in the open. The light is going to shine. It's dark right now. It's dark in America right now. But the light is going to shine, people. We are not far from leaving this earth. This church, our church is going out of here. Churches are going off this earth right here. And I can only tell you this. When that's gone, God help this world. Because without that, well, we know what's going to happen. It's on fire. It's on fire now. We're on fire. 
My wife brought this home to me a couple days ago. I've got to read this. It shocked me beyond belief. In fact, I was trembling by the time I finished reading this. I don't know if it was because I was just so mad or I just couldn't believe it or just what the deal was, but I'm going to read you this right here. I'm going to try to be short. This concerning executive orders. Does everyone know what an executive order is? Executive order is when the president just says, the heck with Congress, I'm giving you this executive order right here and this is what's going to be. And all presidents have used them. I'm not going to say they haven't. But this is the order of executive orders that's going on in our country right now. Teddy Roosevelt had three executive orders. There were none up to then. FDR had 11 in 16 years. Truman had five in seven years. Ike, two in eight years. Kennedy, four in three years. LBJ, four in five years. Nixon, one in six years. Ford, three executive orders in two years. Carter, three in four years. Ronald Reagan, God bless his soul. Five in eight years. Bush, three in four years. Clinton, 15 in eight years. George W. Bush had 62 executive orders in eight years. Our president, up to this moment in our history, has 926 executive orders in three and a half years. Three and a half years, he has 926 executive orders. That means he's bypassed the Congress 926 times and said, this is the way it's going to be. Now, I'm telling you, people, that stands for itself. You don't have to ask another question after that. This regime is taking over this country inside our country using our own laws, exactly like they said they were going to do. Ten years ago, the Arabs stood up and said that they were coming to America yep. and they were going to bring America down from the inside. Well, do we have to ask any questions? No. I, I don't think so. I know I'm preaching to the choir right here and this bunch right here, but we have got to get out, people. We have got to get out and stop this that's happening to our nation. Yep. If for nothing else, for their, for their sakes, these people right here, they're their next generation. I have my daughter right here with me this morning. The next generation. And I'll be darned if I'm going to stand here any longer and take this crap without standing up and saying something. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've had it. I'm up to here with this crap. It's going to stop. And we have to individually, each person, Stand up. We're not taking this anymore. Amen. It's got to stop. Amen. I don't want to take up any more time because I wanted to say one more thing today. God bless this church. Amen. God bless this home right here. God bless all of you. <laughs> At least we have a place to come. Yes. Yes. And we have a pastor that sits up here every Sunday and breathes fire to us. I mean, tells us the truth. We've got to have the truth, people. <laughs> truth is missing in all of this. Jesus said the truth will set you free. Well, there's no truth. There's none. We don't have any truth at all anywhere in these United States. Every branch of this administration is in court. Every single branch of this administration is in court right now. I mean, it's sick. That nation is very ill. And it's on the deathbed this morning. I'm going to tell you people, it's coming. And it's coming fast. Real fast. 
I wanted to say this morning that I thank Dave Cash for letting me speak this morning. I thank the church this morning. God bless all of you. I love every one of you. I want to see good things happen. And things, I'm going to tell you people, good things are going to happen right here. Amen. Right here in this church. Right here. This is a small group. We don't have the flash and the pomp and stuff. We don't have all that. Thank God. We don't need all that. That's not what church is. People go to church and they talk about, oh, look at my clothes. Aren't they, aren't they wonderful? Well, I don't, I don't see anybody doing that here. You know, we're just human people. We're just human beings. We're in a family together right here trying to do the right thing. God sees us. God sees us all. He sees us. He's right here with us this morning. He's right here in this building with us this morning. Two or more believers, He's here, people. He's right here walking these aisles this morning. And He's looking to see how are we gonna, how are we gonna handle this right here? He's looking to see. When you go in that voting booth and pull that voting arm or push that button for that vote, don't think you're the only person in there. He's in there with you. He's right there with you looking at you and he's looking to see. It's going to happen soon, folks. God help us. God, I, I thank God, like I said, for this church so much. It's just like, it's just like homecoming here every time we come here. Amen. You know, it's all hearts and I think hearts and minds and everything in this room, all of us are on the same page. Amen. We want what's right for them. We want what's right for our kids. I mean, we don't want to hand down this mess we got to these kids. My God, it's bad enough as it is right now. Can you imagine what they got in front of them? We've got to stand up. We've got to stand up. Thank you very much. back as the American Revolution, there came a time when the communities had to band together and take care of each other, and a lot of these folks came out of the churches in order to restore order when there was chaos. And this morning, Chris is going to come and speak a little bit about that. This is probably the first time I've been up here where I'm not going to directly address politics. It's probably a good thing. However, I am going to address an issue that's probably going to make you squirm and, and cuss me later because it's a very self-reflective issue. It's something that the first time I read, my jaw hit the floor. And it puts words of, it explains why I am the way I am better than I could have ever done it. And if you hear somebody whispering in between while I'm talking, it's Dave praying, God, please don't embarrass me. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. I'm going to preface this with a story. As in any good southerner, I was walking around Walmart one evening. And as I, I took my goods to the cashier, I was standing there. And the cashier looked at me. She goes, you a cop? I said, no, ma'am. Why are you carrying a gun? I said, because I'm a sheepdog. I smiled and I walked out. Amen. And most of you have been here have seen me. I'm not shy about exercising my Second Amendment right. And I open carry in church 90% of the time for a specific reason. It's not because I'm trying to show off and, and, and stick my chest out and pound on my chest like the big silverback gorilla. It's because I want people to know that if something happens, they know who to come and grab and go, hey, can you take care of this? Yeah. It's because I'm a sheepdog. I've gone through great expense to myself and my family in both money and time to purchase implements and train myself in implements and train my family and train my friends so that when things go horribly, horribly wrong, somebody is there to fix it yeah. or at least attempt to fix it. Yeah. Most any Saturday morning, you'll find me up before daylight training shooting, running. During the week, you'll find me slinging, swinging sledgehammers and throwing tires and crawling across parking lots and whining and crying the next morning because I can hardly move. 
But if I'm not willing to do it, who is? I know that there's a lot more writing on that pain and agony and, and time than just my own self-preservation and my own self-improvement. I personally have a wife and two children to worry about. I have every member of this church to worry about. I have every member of my community to worry about because I'm a sheepdog. I'm going to read this. This is by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. <clears throat> and the title of it is called On Sheep, Wolves, and Sheepdogs. And this perfectly comes from Colonel Muhlenberg and his brother. One was a sheep. One was a sheepdog. And you're going to see it right here. The first, this opens with a statement from William J. Bennett in a lecture that he gave to the United States Naval Academy on November 24, 1997. Honor never grows old, and honor rejoices the heart of age. It does so because honor is, finally, about defending those noble and worthy things that deserve defending, even if it comes at a high cost. In our time, that may mean social disapproval, public scorn, hardship, persecution, or, as always, even death itself. The question remains, what is worth defending? What is worth dying for? What is worth living for? One Vietnam veteran, an old retired colonel, once said this to me. Most of the people in our society are sheep. They are kind, gentle, productive creatures who can only hurt one another by accident. This is true. Remember, the murder rate is 6 per 100,000 per year, and the aggravated assault rate is 4 per 1,000 per year. What this means is that the vast majority of Americans are not inclined to hurt one another. Some estimates say that 2 million Americans are victims of violent crimes every year, a tragic, staggering number, perhaps an all-time record rate of violent crime. But there are almost 300 million Americans, which means that the odds of being a victim of violent crime is considerably less than 1 in 100 on any given year. Furthermore, since many violent crimes are committed by repeat offenders, the actual number of violent citizens is considerably less than 2 million. Thus, there is a paradox, and we must grasp both ends of the situation. We may well be in the most violent times in history, but violence is still remarkably rare. This is because most citizens are kind, decent people who are not capable of hurting each other, except by accident or under extreme provocation. They are sheep. I mean nothing negative by calling them sheep. To me it is like the pretty blue robin's egg. Inside it is soft and gooey, but someday it will grow into something wonderful. But the egg cannot survive without its hard blue shell. Police officers, soldiers, and other warriors are like that shell, and someday the civilization they protect will grow into something wonderful. For now, though, they need warriors to protect them from the predators. Then there are the wolves, the old war veteran said, and the wolves feed on the sheep without mercy. Do you believe that there are wolves out there who will feed on the flock without mercy? You better believe it. There are evil men in this world and they are capable of evil deeds. The moment you forget that or pretend it is not so, you become a sheep. There is no safety in denial. Then there are sheepdogs, he went on, and I am a sheepdog. I live to protect the flock and confront the wolf. If you have no capacity for violence, then you are a healthy protective citizen, a sheep. If you have a capacity for violence and no empathy for your fellow citizens, then you have defined an aggressive sociopath, a wolf. But what if you have a capacity for violence and a deep love for your fellow citizens? What do you have then? A sheepdog, a warrior, someone who is walking the hero's path, someone who can walk into the heart of darkness, into universal human phobia, and walk out unscathed. Let me expand on this old soldier's excellent model of the sheep, wolves, and sheepdogs. We know that the sheep live in denial. That is what makes them sheep. They do not want to believe that there is an evil in the world. They can accept the fact that fires can happen, which is why they want fire extinguishers, fire sprinklers, fire alarms, and fire exits throughout their kids' schools. But many of them are outraged at the idea of putting an armed police officer in their kids' school. Our children are thousands of times more likely to be killed or seriously injured by school violence than fire. But the sheep's only response to the possibility of violence is denial. The idea of someone coming to kill or harm their child is just too hard, and so they chose the path of denial. The sheep generally do not like the sheepdog. He looks a lot like the wolf. He has fangs and the capacity for violence and a beard in certain times of the year. <laughs> the difference, though, is that the sheepdog must not, cannot, and will not ever harm the sheep. Any sheepdog who intentionally harms the lowliest little lamb will be punished and removed. The world cannot work any other way, at least not in a representative democracy or a public such as ours. Still, the sheepdog disturbs the sheep. He is a constant reminder that there are wolves in the land. They would prefer that he didn't tell them where to go or give them traffic tickets or stand at the ready in our airports in camouflage fatigues holding an M16. The sheep would much rather have the sheepdog cash in his fangs, spray paint himself white, and go bah. <laughs> Until the wolf shows up. Then the entire flock tries desperately to hide behind one lowly sheepdog. 
The students, the victims at Columbine High School were big, tough high school students, and under ordinary circumstances, they would not have had the time of day for a police officer. They were not bad kids. They just had nothing to say to a cop. However, when the school was under attack and SWAT teams were clearing the rooms and hallways, the officers had to physically peel those clinging, sobbing kids off of them. This is how the little lambs feel about their sheepdog when the wolf is at the door. Look at what happened after September 11, 2001, when the wolf pounded hard on the door. Remember how America, more than ever before, felt differently about their law enforcement officers and military personnel. Remember how many times you heard the word hero. Understand that there is nothing morally superior about being a sheepdog. It is just what you choose to be. Also understand that a sheepdog is a funny critter. He is always sniffing around out on the perimeter, checking the breeze, barking at things that go bump in the night, and yearning for a righteous battle. That is, the young sheepdogs yearn for a righteous battle. The old sheepdogs are a little older and wiser, but they move to the sound of guns when needed right along with the young ones. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. I talk a big game because I'm young enough to do it, but I know if something goes down, he's going to be right behind me. Here's how the sheep and the sheepdog think differently. The sheep pretend the wolf will never come, but the sheepdog lives for that day. After the attacks on September 11, 2001, most of the sheep, that is most citizens in America, said, thank God I wasn't on one of those planes. The sheepdogs, the warriors said, dear God, I wish I could have been on one of those planes. Maybe I could have made a difference. When you are truly transformed into a warrior and have truly invested yourself into warriorhood, you want to be there. You want to be able to make a difference. There's nothing morally superior about the sheepdog, the warrior, but he does have one real advantage, only one, and that is that he is able to survive and thrive in an environment that destroys 98% of the population. There was research conducted a few years ago with individuals convicted of violent crimes. These cons were imprisoned for serious predatory crimes of violence, assaults, murders, and killing law enforcement officers. The vast majority said that they specifically targeted victims by body language, such as slumped walk, passive behavior, and lack of awareness. They chose their victims like big cats do in Africa, when they select one out of the herd that is least able to protect itself. Some people may be destined to be sheep, and others might be genetically primed to be wolves or sheepdogs, but I believe that most people can choose which one they want to be, and I'm proud to say that more and more Americans are choosing to become sheepdogs. Seven months after the attack on September 11th, Todd Beamer was honored in his hometown of Cranberry, New Jersey. Todd, as you recall, was the man on Flight 93 over Pennsylvania who called on his cell phone to alert an operator from United Airlines about the hijacking. When he learned of the other three passenger planes that had been used as weapons, Todd dropped his phone and uttered the words, let's roll, which authorities believe was a signal to the other passengers to confront the terrorist hijackers. In one hour, a transformation occurred among the passengers, athletes, business people, and parents, from sheep to sheepdogs, and together they fought the wolves, ultimately saving an unknown number of lives on the ground. There is no safety for honest men except by believing all possible evil of evil men, said Edmund Burke. Here is the point I like to emphasize, especially to the thousands of police officers and soldiers I speak to each year. In nature, the sheep, real sheep, are born as sheep. Sheepdogs are born that way, and so are wolves. They didn't have a choice, but you are not a critter. As a human being, you can be whatever you want to be. It is a conscious, moral decision. If you want to be a sheep, then you can be a sheep, and that is okay, but you must understand the price you pay. When the wolf comes, you and your loved ones are going to die if there is not a sheepdog there to protect you. If you want to be a wolf, you can be one, but the sheepdogs are going to hunt you down, and you will never have rest, safety, trust, or love. But if you want to be a sheepdog and walk the warrior's path, then you must make a conscious and moral decision every day to dedicate, equip, and propel yourself to thrive in that toxic, corrosive moment when the wolf comes knocking at the door. For example, many officers carry their weapons in church. Many non-officers carry their weapons in church. <laughs> they are well concealed in ankle holsters, shoulder holsters, or inside the belt holsters tucked into the small of their backs. Anytime you go to some form of religious service, there's a very good chance that a police officer in your congregation is carrying. You will never know if there's such an individual in your place of worship until the wolf appears to massacre you and your loved ones. I was training a group of police officers in Texas, and during the break, one officer asked his friend if he carried his weapon in church. The other cop replied, I will never be caught without my gun in church. I asked why he felt so strongly about this, and he told me about a cop he knew who was at a church massacre in Fort Worth, Texas in 1999. 
In that incident, a mentally deranged individual came into the church and opened fire, gunning down 14 people. He said that the officer believed he could have saved every life that day if he had been carrying his gun. His own son was shot, and all he could do was throw himself on the body and wait for him to die. That cop looked me in the eye and said, Do you have any idea how hard it would be to live with yourself after that? Some individuals would be horrified if they knew this police officer was carrying a weapon in church. They might call him paranoid and would probably scorn him. Yet these same individuals would be enraged and would call for heads to roll if they found out the airbags in their cars were defective or that the fire extinguisher and fire sprinklers in their kids' school did not work. They can accept the fact that fires and traffic accidents can happen and that there must be safeguards against them. Their only response to the wolf, though, is denial. And all too often their response to the sheepdog is scorn and disdain. But the sheepdog quietly asks himself, do you have any idea how hard it would be to live with yourself if your loved ones attacked and killed and you had to stand there helplessly because you were unprepared for that day? It is denial that turns people into sheep. Sheep are psychologically destroyed by combat because their only defense is denial, which is counterproductive and destructive, resulting in fear, helplessness, and horror when the wolf shows up. Denial kills you twice. It kills you once at your moment of truth when you were not physically prepared. You didn't bring your gun. You didn't train. Your only defense was wishful thinking. Hope is not a strategy. Denial kills you a second time because even if you do physically vibe, you are psych survive, you are psychologically shattered by your fear, helplessness, and horror at your moment of truth. Gavin De Becker put it like this in Fearless, his superb post-9-11 book, which should be required reading for anyone trying to come to terms with our current world situation. Denial can be seductive but it has an insidious side effect. For all the peace of mind deniers think they get by saying it isn't so, they, fail, they fall, they take, when faced with new violence is all the more unsettling. Denial is a save now, pay later scheme. A contract written entirely in small print for in the long run the denying person knows the truth on some level. And so the warrior must strive to confront denial in all aspects of his life and prepare himself for the day when evil comes. If you are a warrior who is legally authorized to carry a weapon and you step outside without that weapon, then you become a sheep, pretending that the bad man will not come today. No one can be on 24-7 for a lifetime. Everyone needs downtime. But if you are authorized to carry a weapon and you walk outside without it, just take a deep breath and say this to yourself. Bah. <laughs> the business of being a sheep or a sheepdog is not a yes-no dichotomy. It is not an all or nothing either or choice. It is a matter of degrees, a continuum. On one end is an abject head in the sand sheep and on the other end is the ultimate warrior. Few people exist completely on one end or the other. Most of us live somewhere in between. Since 9-11 almost everyone in America took a step up that continuum away from denial. The sheep took a few steps toward accepting and appreciating their warriors and the warriors started taking their job more seriously. The degree to which you move up that continuum away from sheephood and denial is a degree to which you and your loved ones will survive physically and psychologically at your moment of truth. When you said last week that somebody was busting your windows out and I said tell me where you live and I'll get it taken care of, that's the sheep dog. Because I'm not going to wait on the police to take care of something that I can take care of myself. When I stood in that line and I talked to that lady at Walmart I said, you'd be thankful that I'm standing here if somebody runs through that door with a gun in their hand. I said, you question me now, but you'd thank me later. And it's something that you all have to think about. Is where do you stand? If you are a sheep, there's nothing wrong with that. But don't, don't try to confuse the sheepdog for the wolf. You know, we're not predators. You know, we are here to protect the flock, protect those that can't protect themselves. That's what we do. That's why we do what we do. I recently took an oath, and I'm not going to get into it any more than that. But I'm going to read you that oath as I close. I, Christopher Ryan Moore, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend both the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and I will defend the American people and their liberties. So help me God. Thank you, brother.
And finally, before we have our special music for the morning, Brother Nicky, if you'd come, please. Well, she had something funny to say, but just look at me. <laughs> going to be reading from Jeremiah, the 32nd chapter. We're just going to read a couple verses. Because of all the evil of the children of Israel and of the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, and their prophets, and the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and they have turned unto me the back and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened, unto, hearkened to receive instruction, but they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. And they built the high places of Baal, or Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnon, to cause their sons and their daughter to pass through the fire to Moloch, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination and to cause Judah to sin. There is... Sin has been around, let's make no mistake about it, since Adam fell, and it's increased and it's got worse. There is a prevailing sin that governs man today and I'm going to be specific at the top, but it trickles down simply because it's a governing demonic spirit from hell. I'm going to use the homosexual because this is where a lot of the things have stemmed from in this country. They have, you asked yourself, I asked myself, why must they be acknowledged every day? My God does not get that acknowledgement. Do they show Christ and what He done for us every day? Absolutely not. But Hollywood has saw fit to glorify the practice of sodomy and of a homosexual practice and have run my Savior into the dirt. Now, this, I'm not laying this with no name. I put no face to it, but I tell you it's a demonic spirit. This is what's going on. I lay the blame at politically correctness for those souls of those men who were killed on our military base in the United States. This is on political correctness. They took the men's lives because nobody would say anything for that officer who had planned to kill that Muslim officer. And most of all, I want to tell you, I, used to, I watched the news, Shirley won't let me most of the time, because I get so irate and I've thought about this thing. Why do I get so upset? Why do I get so mad? And I'll tell you why. I'm going to express it right now to you. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. That's in St. Luke. That's the 13th chapter, the third verse. And listen. Listen. Let me find it. And the men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which hath power over these plagues and they repented not to give Him glory. When people will not own up to their own lies, what can you say? Thank you, gentlemen. Now they're all fleeing the ship. <laughs> I'm not sure I like that. Amen. Which one first? We're going to introduce our first song. We have two for you this morning. A lot of talk.
talk about the rights that we have as Christians and how they're taken away from us all the time. You hear it all the time from this pulpit, and it's, you need to be aware of it, but you also need to be aware that you still have the right to be a Christian, right. and you need to yeah. exercise that right yes, Lord, yeah. as such. And this song speaks right to that. It's called, I've Got a Right to Pray. King told Daniel not to pray to his God anymore. For I'll lock you in the lion's den and throw away the key to the door. The very next day found Daniel down on his bed and knee. The difference is time he opened the blinds for the whole wide world to see. He said, I don't care what you say. I'm going to pray anyway. I'm going to lift my hand up to the Lord for the things he's done for me. I just gotta get away, find a place to seek his face. I don't care what you say, I've got a right to pray. Well, they tell our children not to pray when they walk through the schoolhouse doors. According to the Constitution, you can't do that anymore. Well, I wonder what old Daniel would say if he were alive today. If the judge declared no more prayer, I believe old Daniel would say, Hey, I don't care what you say. I'm going to pray anyway. I'm going to lift my hands up to the Lord for the things he's done for me. I just got to get away. Find a place to seek his face. I don't care what you say. I've got a right to pray. I don't care what you say. I'm going to pray anyway. I'm going to lift my hands up to the Lord for the things he's done for me. I just got to get away. Find a place to seek his face. I don't care what you say. I've got a right to pray. I don't care what you say, I've got a right to pray. I don't, I don't care, I've got a right to pray. Amen, that's right. Amen. Praise his name. Amen, that's right, we do. Amen. Thank you. Well, when Torrance was um, combating us, and directing us, and overseeing us, and whatever else he was doing with us, yes. <laughs> bullying us, cracking the whip, making us cry, he found a whole lot of different music that <laughs> encouraged us and, and challenged us. And this is one of the songs that he found. And uh, he found this one... Uh, I believe the family was called Corliss, uh, a mother and two daughters, mm -hmm. and they sang a bunch of songs, and they had a really strong, strong southern accent. Yes. Emphasis on strong. 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 Did she say strong? She said and, Amen. And when we <laughs> first strong. heard it, we were all like, oh, yeah. I said no. We can't do that. Anna said no. Anna said know a lot of times about that. <laughs> that's all right <laughs> but you know as we listen to that and Torrance would play it the the cd you know every once in a while and the more we listen to the words mm -hmm. it was like you know this has a message we need to we need to do something with this Amen. and so um with Torrance guiding us and with we we all had some input about you know the way we were going to sing the song and the way we would project the words. Mm -hmm. I don't think we sound country. <laughs> Amen. But we have the message. That's right. And you've heard this song before. And the message is still there. Mm -hmm. It's called America Come Home. Amen. 
to the land of the free and the home of the brave we'll gladly pledge our allegiance until our grave established on the bible founded on god's word it's time that we as christians speak out that we might be heard that a house divided against itself cannot stand alone and this is a cry of god almighty america come home one nation under god is it still true today or have we wandered farther farther freedom for all all the truths of the bible we stood proud and tall now we're murdering our children condoning wicked men oh can't you see the difference between now and then but the father's waiting patiently our sins to atone and this is the cry of god almighty america come home one nation under god is it still true today or have we wandered farther farther Thank you very much. We have one more special song for you this morning. I know it's I know you're really gonna like it. This is Torrance Hedrick and he'll introduce the song. They give me a short lease here. So I can't, I can't run too far. I don't know about y'all, but that song just touched my heart, I'm tell you. How many veterans we got in here? Just raise your hands up high. I'm one. We've got Oscar. There's one. Let me tell you something. There's your sheepdogs. How many is carrying in here today? There's some more, you sheep dogs. <laughs> they say guns kill people. Guns kill people. That's what they say. And it's loaded. Ain't no good if it ain't. So while I'm singing this next song, I want to see how many people that gun kills. If tomorrow all the things were gone I'd worked for all my life And I had to start again 
with just my children and my wife. I thank my lucky stars to be living here today, cause that flag still stands for freedom, and they can't take that away. I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died Who gave that right to me And I'll gladly stand up next to you And it been her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA The words are true, don't tread on me. From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to Shannon Sea, from Detroit down to Houston, from New York to LA, there's a pride in every American's heart And it's time we stand and say I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died Who gave that right to me And I'll gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today cause there ain't no doubt i love this land god bless the usa and i'm proud to be an american where at least i know i'm free and i won't forget the men who died, who gave that right to me, and I'll gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today, cause there ain't no doubt I love this land, God bless the USA. When my country called, I went and I served. When Oscar's country called, he went and he served. When Roger's country called, he went and he served. There's backbone there. A lot of knowledge there. Oscar's got a lot of knowledge. If you ever sit down and talk to him, he can tell you a whole lot of things. They're trying to strip your rights away. You know what? Not one person got hurt. Not one person got hurt. But you know what kills? It's not this gun. It's the stupid idiots behind it. And I'm not going to stand here and let a stupid idiot come in and point a gun at me and think he's going to pull the trigger that I'm not going to fire back. He can go on and go to hell. That's all I can say. We all stand for the reading of God's word this morning. We all stand for the reading of God's word. Before I read God's word this morning, Chris a little while ago spoke about not allowing cops in the schools. Well, there's something else they took out of schools too. They took prayer out and they took that flag out. Yeah. So right now, before I see, read God's word, I would like everybody to join me and say in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. God's word comes today out of Second Chronicles chapter seven, starting at the 12th verse. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself 
for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I commanded the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open, and mine ears attend into the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. As for thee, if thou wilt walk with me as David thy father walked, and do according to all of that I have commanded, they shall observe my statutes and my judgments. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Amen. If you would please turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. It's time to get to it. Before I read from Joshua 7, I want you to understand that Israel is still God's chosen people. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about that. The Bible's plain. They serve God and they love God and He preserved them. And no one could stand against that little nation for God fought their battles for them. But here in Joshua chapter 7, we see where they failed because of sin in the camp. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was set on fire against the children of Israel. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth -Avon on the east side of Bethel. And he spoke to them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and they viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said, Let not all the people go up, but only about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and not make all the people to labor, because they are small. They are just a handful of them. So they went up there and the people uh, of the people, about 3,000 men, but they wound, wound up fleeing before Ai. They turned and ran from the little city of Ai. And the men of Ai smote them, about 30 and 6 men, for they chased them from the gate even unto Shebarim and smote them in the going down or going down the hillside, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and they became as water. And Joshua tore his clothes, and he fell, fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dirt on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. What a whiny man. And the Lord, O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall circle us around and cut off their name from the earth. And what will you do unto your great name? And the Lord said this to him, get up. Why are you laying on your face? Israel has sinned. And they have transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have taken of the accursed thing and have stolen and dissembled also. And they put it even among their own stuff. And then this is what he says. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies. And turn their backs before their enemies. Because they were accursed. 
Neither will I be with you any more except you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Get up and sanctify the people and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel, and you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. We know that it was confessed and it was brought out publicly what the accursed thing was. They had taken things that had belonged to the enemy and hid it. And God brought them out and destroyed them right in front of everybody and laid a pile of stones over the whole family that committed it to where it was a, more, a memorial to this day not to take the, of the accursed thing to follow the word of God. And having said that, I'm going to say this, America... Whether anybody likes it or not, I don't care. America was founded by God. Amen. By God. And it was founded not only by God, it was founded for God and to serve God. And our constitution and our laws were taken out of the word of God. Along the way, some of our leaders failed to follow God's directive and we suffered for our abuses through our losses and our wars. We were supposed to be a Christian nation and we were supposed to defend the Christian moral way of life. God spared us from all of the other pearls that the other countries are going through even at this moment because we used to honor Him. Our churches were strong. Our education was moral and godly and our armies were invincible. All because we tried to keep this a Christian nation. Patrick Henry stood and warned that the day would come when a godless Supreme Court would reinterpret this sacred document we call the Constitution and interpret it no longer in the light of a Christian nation. And he proved to be a prophet of God because that is exactly what happened. A festering sore by the name of communism was brought about by a man who let his own family starve to death. And his name is Karl Marx. And we've got college professors glorifying this scum like he was something great. And ever since, these devils have had their eyes on America and the sacred jewel that we call freedom. If you don't think so, in 1963, the communists had a manifesto out that was uh, put on the register in Congress and read. And just a few of the goals that they had for this country that they wanted to do was, first of all, develop the illusion that total disarmament of the United States would be a demonstration of moral strength. Permit free trade between all nations regardless of communist affiliation and regardless of whether or not items could be used for war. Provide American aid to all nations regardless of their communist domination. Grant recognition of Red China. Admit them to the UN. Pro promote the United Nations as the only hope for mankind. God help us. If its charter is rewritten, demand that it be set up as a one world government with its own independent armed forces and resist any attempt to outlaw the Communist Party. The, uh, an archbishop here lately wanted to know why they haven't moved on with it and why we don't have a one world government. And I wanted to tell him, hang on, it's coming and you'll get to be part of it. Yeah. Do away with loyalty oaths. Continue giving Russia access to the U.S. Patent Office. Get control of the schools. Use them as transmission belts for socialism and current communist propaganda. Soften the curriculum. Get a control of the teachers unions and put the party line in the textbooks. Gun, uh, gain control of all student newspapers. Use student riots to foment public protest against programs or organizations which are under communist attack. I'm not going to read them all. But it says, break down cultural standards of morality by promoting pornography and obscenity in books, magazines, motion pictures, radio, and TV. Present homosexuality, degeneracy, and promiscuity as normal, natural, and healthy. 
infiltrate the churches and replace revealed religion with social religion, discredit the Bible, and emphasize the need for intellectual maturity that does not need a religious crutch. Eliminate prayer or any phase of religious expression in the schools on the grounds that it violates the principle of separation of church and state. Discredit the American Constitution by calling it inadequate, old-fashioned, out of step with modern needs and a hindrance to cooperation between nations on a worldwide basis and discredit the Founding Fathers. There's about 40 more of them, but I don't think I need to go any further. You get the gist of it, I hope. America has taken of the accursed thing and the anger of God has been kindled against America. We have embraced the goals of a wicked, godless government form or movement known as communism. We have it right now in this country and many of our leaders confess to being communist. Yes. On top of that, we have killed our babies by the millions. And people act like an abortion mill is a sacred sanctuary when they ought to be torn down in shreds with a bulldozer. They even have special laws passed to protect them. But nobody, nobody will pass a law to protect the innocent little babies that are murdered in those hell holes in ways that would make Adolf Hitler proud. Nobody will stand up and nobody will pass a law. We have embraced immorality and sexual perversion and we have demanded that it be normalized in our society and anyone that speaks out against it is deemed to be mentally ill. We have practiced greed and we have worshipped money and we will step on anybody to get it. Our whole country runs on what the banks and Wall Street dictates to us instead of what the Word of God says. We have not only allowed false religions to be protected at the expense of what was called a Christian nation, and this may get me shot at this week, but it's time that somebody said it, and somebody said this from the pulpit, what I'm getting ready to say, but we are embracing the religion of a demon-possessed pedophile by the name of Mohammed. And a religion that wants to cut the heads off of every Christian and every Jew on this planet. Well, you want to say, why do you call them a pedophile? I'll tell you why. They're trying to pass a law right now to allow men to marry nine-year-old girls. What do you call it? What do you call it? We have run Christ out of our workplaces, our schools, and our courts. And as a result, they have come, become corrupted. We tell our children that they are nothing more than animals, that that's the way they evolved and that there is no God. And now, guess what? They're acting like it and we are acting all surprised. Jesus said, fill you up the measure of your fathers. If you tell them that their father is a monkey, they're going to act like one. We have allowed a wicked and perverted and godless media to tell us what is going on in the world. You turn it on and they're grinning at you every morning, telling you nothing but one lie after another. They lie with every breath. And we believe everything they say is the gospel, but nobody will believe anything that's in this right here. Oh, everybody thinks that what George Step on all of us says is true, but they won't believe anything from the Word of God. Hollywood has become an open sewer flowing with the filth of the vilest sort. And yet we allow them to dictate our morals and our norms while we sit there night after night just drooling at the TV and admiring these people. And they're tearing down the family. Our music industry has been used to promote every kind of sexual sin that you can imagine. Things that would make Sodom and Gomorrah blush with shame. We have embraced communism. And now our leadership doesn't even bother to hide it anymore. With words like distribute the wealth. Move forward. I think that's what Stalin said when they moved forward and butchered half of their people. Let's move forward. Divide it up. Take from those who do work and give it to those who won't work. Not can't work, but won't work. 
Our president even said on video that he was a Muslim and George Stephanopoulos had to correct him. Had to correct him. And he was take, had a picture taken bowing down and kissing the hand of a Saudi prince. The president of the United States isn't supposed to bow down to anybody but Jesus. Nobody. There was a time when they bowed down to the United States. But we are so worried about getting their oil, we'll do anything. And then he said that he surrounded himself with Marxists and was proud of it. We have turned away from Israel that God said is the apple of my eye. God said that Israel is the apple of his eye. And he said, I'll, I'll bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. And he never has changed that. And now we're giving money to heathens by the billions that want to destroy that nation. America has taken of the accursed thing and we will never return to what we once were until we have a revival. I'm here to tell you that no man running for office can fix this. Nobody, no politician, no governor, no senator, no president, we have got to have a revival. That's what this country has got to have or it's never going to happen. The very fact that we don't even have an actual Christian running for office is a shame before God. I'm just going to be honest with you. Our founding fathers once said, and they wrote it down, that if you were not a Christian, you were not fit to hold public office. Now you are not fit to hold public office if you are a Christian. As far as the country is concerned, America is standing at a precipice looking over a cliff and we're ready to plunge downward where we cannot recover we are more than 15 trillion dollars in debt our schools have failed our armies are being attacked all over the world and we have no morals anymore nothing is right and nothing is wrong it's whatever goes along with the situation and we are poised to turn into a poor ignorant third world nation that's going to run into the arms of the United Nations to save us and enslave us, all the while saying, well, God is saying this, all of the nations that forget me will be turned into hell. I didn't say it, God said it. America's on fire and Nero is fiddling. Nobody understands the urgency. Nobody hardly in this country understands the urgency of what's going on because everybody is retracted into their own little world, turning the TV up a little bit louder and hoping it'll go away. Even our elderly that have been through so much said that could not possibly happen here. Couldn't possibly happen here. This is America. And they've been lied to and do not realize it's already happening. The news media that was once trusted is no more than a liberal lapdog and they lie to the elderly every day while they're watching their TV saying everything is all right. Yeah. Our young people are saying, this is great. Oh, this is, this is great. Because they were trained this way in corrupted public schools. Like it or not, that's the fact. That's the bottom line. And then the colleges, oh my Lord in heaven, the colleges what they're doing to the young people. And now our precious young people that's getting ready to come up and go into society have no idea what's coming. And then my generation thinks it's all about money. If we could just get some more money, we'd be fine. Buy gold, they say. Oh yeah, go, go get some gold. Well, let me tell you something. The Bible said that the day is coming that it will take an entire day's wages to buy one loaf of bread. What are you going to do with all that gold then? You going to eat the gold? Huh? It says that, that James says that all the gold and all the silver you can get together is going to canker. It's going to rust. America, listen to me carefully. America is on fire and the church is holding the water hose. America has the water hose in their hand, but the church itself has taken of the accursed thing too. 
And that's why nothing's being done. The churches have sacrificed their futures on the altar of political correctness. Nobody's scared to say anything. They're so worried that somebody's going to get offended. Let me tell you something. Every time I preach, if somebody don't get offended, I have not done my job. I feel like B.R. Lakin. I need to go to the altar after I'm done preaching because I preach myself under conviction. We have allowed the unsaved, wicked world. I want y'all to hear this because you get faced with this every day and not a single one of y'all have not, uh, all of you have heard what I'm telling you. We allow the unsaved, wicked world to misquote God's word. Every time you speak up, they're going, oh, you know, you can't judge. Y'all can't judge. Who are you to judge me? You hear that all the time? You know, when somebody says that, they're living like the devil and they don't want to hear what you got to say. That's what the bottom line is. You ain't supposed, now, now we're not supposed to judge. All the while people are living like the devil, claiming to be saved and knowing that they got a blank check to do it. Yeah. Because the pastors and the congregations are so scared that they might offend somebody. And now for the sake of money and sake of crowds, our pastors and our people have lost their spine and they've turned their heads and the church has no more power than Lot did before Sodom and Gomorrah burnt to the ground. Hold on, I'll let you go in a minute. 